Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Global War Room Scenario War Game. I'm Slava. Um, you guys might watch other playthroughs I have. This is War Room. Uh, a little bit about me. I hate dice games. I absolutely despise Axis and Allies. I played it once. A friend invited me over. And this is when I was just getting into board gaming. And I swear to God, if that was the first board game I played, I would never play the game in my life. I do. I remember we were fucking foe at his house. And I was waiting for an hour and a half between turns. It was horrendous. So what is War Room? War Room is a game designed by the guy that made the Axis and Allies. And it's a lot of dice rolling. So why am I playing it? Well, I, I went online, watched a couple videos. I first thing that intrigued me about this game was just the world map. It's circular. It's just a neat design. You don't see it, how he was able to incorporate that. Second of all, it's grand scale. It's a large scale war. And I was told just from watching different videos and commentaries that this is the epitome of um, the World War II war gaming experience. So I was like, why not give it a shot? In this commentary, we're just going to go through what's happening. Right now, we are uh, deciding turn orders by fading oil. And uh, just because you get chosen doesn't mean you get the next pick. Uh, you can choose whatever spots available. As you can see here, the Italians chose to go 6th instead of 7th instead of 5th. Um, and then after you, uh, you bid your oil, you guys get your spot selections, then you uh, subtract the oil from your uh, resource count for each faction. But yeah, I hate Axis and Allies. Uh, and this game was different. Uh, this is my, I would say, third, well, fourth, fifth playthrough, but third time I'm actually attempting to play a uh, larger game. Twice I didn't finish it. In this game, the continent of the continent is going to be able to get the world. In the game, the Australian is going to be able to get the world. 東からやってくるアメリカの戦争機会に備えるだけでなく、多くの島々を集中させる必要があります。今のところ、戦略は英国海軍を無力化し、中国への作戦を開始することです。One thing we're trying to do is,、um, as a Chinese, as a Japanese player here, really clearly want to control the dominant side, the Pacific front,、uh, the ocean. And、um, China is going to be a pain in the butt. So, the Japanese players just try and take advantage of China, take control of the land there, and、uh, just pretty much push them out before they become too annoying of a threat.、Uh, there is a pact between Russia and Japan, and either one invades each other, they're going to get sick stress, which is going to cause just unnecessary long term frustrations. This war will be one dictated by us towards victory or defeat. We are far away from all threats and need to focus on building up our forces and making a dominant stance in the Navy warfare. We cannot forget about supporting the British, but primary focus must be cutting off Japan in the Pacific. I'm excited to see how we can change the past with my strategic approach and hopefully reduce the use of an atomic bomb. I mean, not much to say here, really. The Americans are.、Uh, I mean, I don't know too much World War II history. I just like competitive board games. But it seems like the Americans are pinned between the,、um, the Japanese side and the German side, really, with not much forces in the battle. And the American player clearly is just trying right now to send as much support out as possible. As a German player, I want to make sure that. Dass wir erstens die Ukraine nicht verlieren und zweitens hart gegen die Sowjets kämpfen und dass wir um Großbritannien herum in den Griff bekommen. Jetzt weiß ich, wie sich die Geschichte entwickelt hat, aber das bedeutet nicht, dass sie sich wiederholen muss. Solange wir mit unseren Einheitentypen diversifiziert bleiben und mit unserer industriellen Macht den Kräftevorteil behalten, sollten wir siegreich werden. So what I'm trying to do as this game goes on is just kind of show you guys、uh, some rules and stuff. For example,、uh, narrow sea passages. It's kind of like canals and stuff. I thought this was a pretty interesting concept because it blocks movement, and then you have to. There's certain. You're not just pieces on the map. We actually have certain strategic advantages taking over canals and so forth. And good job in design there. And you can read about them as you go on the game. I can go too much detail, but one thing is. When planes fly out, they have to 
at the end of the round fly onto a natural uh, an ally or an alliance's uh, like controlled territory. So what you do is you put these markers out on planes to mark that they've flown out, and then at the, uh, I think it's a ground five, you send them back to land. So that's where you see those little red flags. I mean red arrows. Red arrow means uh, the Axis Alliance. Blue arrow means the uh, I don't know what it's called. The uh, I don't know. Good guy alliance. As you can tell, my history is fabulous with World War II. Um, Germans, very strong control, very strong industry in the beginning. Мы не хотим войны с Японией просто так. Для нас будет крайне важно выдержать сильный натиск Германии в самом начале. Мы должны сосредоточиться на закрытии нашего Западного фронта и создании сильной обороны против любых подобных нападений. Это будет веселая игра, и мы сделаем все возможное для Родины. Well, I mean, everybody knows about Russia. And um, really heavy on the, uh, what is that, Western Front. Uh, right now, uh, as a Russian player, they're not too worried about Japan because the Japanese Russian pack, like we mentioned earlier, it's going to add six stress to your um, cut, your faction, whatever you call it, if whoever breaks the pact. So nobody wants to start the war there, which is pretty awesome thematically. Um, Russian player isn't really too strong, isn't really too diversified. They are just trying to hold off the Germans from what it seems like the idea is uh, let's hold Germany off until the Americans and the British come to kind of assist and hopefully put a, some dent on the German industry in Ukraine. And I think that is, is a Belarus right there. Another great thing about this game is they have uh, railways. So you can transport troops down to like a rail station or a rail design. They get bombed uh, by bombers and then you cut off access. Wow, beh, non siamo sicuramente l'esercito più forte e più mobile all'inizio del gioco. Ma siamo alleati dei tedeschi e speriamo di aiutarli a cacciare gli inglesi dall'Africa. Dobbiamo prendere il controllo di un altro paese industriale il prima possibile per non essere bloccati da uno spazio industriale. Siamo fiduciosi che, con la giusta pianificazione, la storia non si ripeterà. Italy has a movement restriction of six movement uh, actions they can do. Uh, faction starts off pretty weak. One thing I didn't realize, actually, when I'm playing the Global War is, they can only build from whatever their home base is. What is that? Italy. They can, that's the only industry they have now. Everything Woman不能交易,建造装甲,或任何战舰。但我们能做的,就是骚扰和戳这个巨大的帝国,希望能造成混乱。我认为,如果日本人无视我们,他们会为此付出巨大的代价。Oh, you mate, it's the bloody fight. You know, when I will test the will of our decisions. Germany is clearly the majority threat. But we are not oblivious to the Australian side of the board. Our goals, round one is crippled the Japanese Navy in the Pacific and prepare to storm Europe. Man, this game will shape to be an uh, interesting one. Subtitle, a cup of tea. Now don't get mad at me or my British players from England. I don't even know how to do a British accent, but yeah, the English, the British, English, I'm not sure what the difference is. Again, historically inaccurate that I am. Uh, they seem to have, what I noticed playing this game, I actually talked to a friend at work was, it is astonishing how much power or uh, influence the British players have. I mean, they're in South Africa, they're in Australia, they're in the Pacific. It's mind-boggling. I never realized it until setting up this board game how much, I guess, the British Empire, how huge it was before World War II. So that's something interesting I learned. Right now we're setting up to uh, hotspots for war. Uh, China is going to Indonesia. Yeah, so also right now we're setting up the uh, carrier fighter movements. Um, they can be put on the territory that is parent to the carrier, the fighters, or an adjacent territory of wherever the carrier is at. So we're locating carriers are the green ships. Those are like those uh, rectangle looking uh, pieces. And then the green ones on there. There's yellow, red, green, and blue. Uh, combat, I think 
one thing that intrigued me about this game more, 100% more than Axis and Allies, any game is better than Axis and Allies, um, is the combat here. One, you have stances, you can go offensive, defensive, it increases, decreases your dice rolls. Another thing you can do is um, you can also build units that are less likely to get hit based on their color, so you can focus on artillery or armor that increases your chance. And another big thing here in this game is you're rolling a ton of dice. So uh, there's battles where you're rolling 20 plus dice, um, which just increases the chance of one, things action, things happening. And um, it just moves quick. It really moves quick once you're doing It's color coded. You go yellow, blue, green. Uh, I think it's yellow, blue, green, red, black, and then white. And the board is set up yellow infantry, blue artillery, green armor, black is wild, and white is to kill off any um, units that have sustained damage. So, one of the tough things when um, editing this is uh, we're gonna go through one battle, which is this battle here, but it is pretty. Um, I don't know how fun it is to watch. I've been playing the game, I'm having fun, but if I'm watching this right now, it's roll dice, you assign damage, so forth. So as you as you watch after this one battle here, I just slowly start eliminating, you know, the dice rolls, eliminating the setups. It's just more of like here's a battle. Uh, but yeah, just really quick. When units are damaged but not eliminated, you can't pay any one resource to heal them up. And then units that have been eliminated to go to a casualty board. Uh, which is where they get set right now. And then later on, you're gonna take uh, stress. The nation takes stress. The more units it loses. And some nations like Germany can hold a lot of stress. Other nations like China or Italy have a low stress tolerance. Uh, in this case here, uh, Japan took over a place from China. Uh, they're gonna put a flag marker there. They take the territory from China, hold on to it. China takes on two stress based on strategic value and Japan will get one medal because they took over a non-capital uh, territory. And that's what happens there. Like right here, I already set the units up. I'm not sure how you guys want me to proceed if you're watching this. This is just round one. Uh, do you want to just see the end result like this or do you actually want to go through all the dice? To me, it doesn't matter. It's just how bored do you want to be and how entertaining is it to see how the dice roll play out. That's really what it is about here. Uh, NG. So like right now, Solomon's Island was supposed to be in battle in the beginning, which I caught right there. Uh, it starts fighting. And Egypt right now is embattled. Embattled means that uh, armies fought uh, for the round and nobody took over the territory. There's still two opposing factions or opposing alliances. And so the territory comes in battle, which means that it produces less resources. Um, it gets flipped and has lesser resource value that the, that the nation who controls it will receive. Now, another cool thing about this game is, like right now, China's taking over Indonesia. There is no J uh, Japanese soldiers there, but they, every land that doesn't have units has a garrison there. You roll to dice, if it's the same color, you roll, they kill one of your units. And China took over Indonesia, which I was pretty surprised and shocked with. And these battles, they get pretty intense. I mean, you have naval, air warfare. I mean, it's pretty fun. It does take a bit of time with the rolling, but you come. it comes with two boards, so you can have two guys rolling. Um, well, technically, I have an exp I got double dice, so I have 20 dice, but you can have two fights going on simultaneously if you wanted to. Here's the naval combat. I mean, this is the outcome of it. I didn't really show you how it, how it went down, but um, pretty much long story short, uh, the British player lost his entire Navy fleet in that region. Yeah, and it's, as you can see, it's fun. It's it's pretty good. It's enjoyable. It's, you're always, it's Axis and Allies. You're sitting around doing nothing. Here, you're always constantly moving. One thing I did do here, if you guys want to decide, is I just did like times 800 speed. Ultimately, I'll just check the comments on YouTube and I'll figure out what you guys, how you guys want to see it. I have every single battle recorded so you can see exactly how it went down. Um, but yes, uh, here, uh, I didn't realize that uh, the Germans had two submarines and the Americans had a battleship. 
and uh, it's still casualties are taken. Uh, there's an embattlement in the seafront. Um, it'll become a hot spot later on, I should notice. But yeah, I mean, it's like I said, what I enjoy is uh, you really feel like combat is a lot more like, oh, it's not that one was it, D6 in Axis and Allies. Here it's a, I think it's a 12 sided dice, or maybe 10 sided. But it doesn't matter. It's it feels more fair. It just mentally feels more. Hey, mm, okay, I guess I lost that battle. You know, uh, it doesn't feel like uh, I don't know. I just I, I really hate Axe and Allies. Um, yeah, I'm. I mean, Larry, I, the guy that created this game. I feel I'm sorry, but I mean, that was that game made? I think in the '80s, if I'm correct. Axe and Allies games, yeah. and um, never been a fan, as you can. I'll beat this horse to death. Um, carrier fight there. Nothing happened. Nobody, no casualties. The two, every, when a carrier's uh, fight's over, carriers just get put back in the box. If they do get killed, they go to the casualty. Um, after all the combat's done, um, land combat units, any kind of planes that flew out, which have the arrows on them, they have to now land in a friendly territory. Or uh, friendly territory is any territory you or anyone in your alliance controls. So, which is, and they can move two X's there. So that's what's going on here. All the planes that went out for battle, they have to find friendly territory to land in. Another interesting thing, if you read FAQ, I didn't know this uh, until I read FAQ, but planes can fly over in passable terrain. It says impassable by land, but I didn't think about it until, you know, you just, you don't think about it until you read the FAQ. You're like, oh wait, I didn't, why did I do that? And what is that ocean region? That A4. I wonder what that... I mean, I guess there really is no name for it. But A4, as you can tell, it's still in battle. But, I mean, Germans are really kind of holding the, a bigger force there. So any token that has blue, red and blue, that means it's in battle. That means there's a battle going on. And at the start of next round, it will reset to a hot spot. Which means you have to uh, resolve the battle if there's... Enemy units present. Right now, the American player obviously is trying to get his planes out there, trying to get his troops to the Pacific front. And the British here, uh, they lost the sea battle pretty hard. And so we're just going to see how the, what happens there in round two. Now, what happens is uh, you take all your casualties for every nation. This is the first edition casualty list, casualty board. I did order the second edition, it's coming in at some point, but. So like different units have different casualty values, like you can see 2, 4, 6, 8, uh, 2, 4, 6, 10, 12, 20. And then up top, you have like, if you have between 0 and 18 points, you take 0 stress. Between 20 and 34 points, you take 1 stress and so forth. 90 plus, you take 5 stress. And um, now we'll go to production stage, uh, when little guy joined me, you, which is awesome. You get to build units. I enjoy it also too, it's kind of like you do want to build units. And then you place them out, you pay for them uh, with the resource cost, and then you place them on industry areas uh, limited to the ch chimney stacks. So for example, the American unit here, he has a resource account up top, he tracks how much it costs, he subtracts it from his resources here that he has stockpiled, uh, that's Company Heroes talk now, and then he puts them on factory positions. Those chimneys dictate how many plastic units you can build there, and then you put this token on top, that token is actually kind of an annoying token. It always falls. I wish it was a different design, but it, that just signifies, hey, these units are being produced. And if a territory ever gets taken over by the enemy where you're producing units, they will actually capture them and keep them and get to use them. So you don't want to produce too far in the front line, and but you also don't want to produce too far in the back line because at that point, you have to send the units in. And uh, as you can see, it repeats where you, every... Um, is it faction? Every army, I guess? I don't know what the proper word is. Again, more company heroes talk there. Uh, so Germany is building in France, trying to build a ship out, a battleship, and uh, and then also, I forget the last story, Tory was. China has interesting rules. China is the only faction that when they build, they automatically come produced. Um, and they can only build infantry and artillery another strange rule for the Chinese they're really limited they can't trade oil they can't trade iron uh, they can't trade anything 
uh, and they can't even build artilleries until they took over a factory, an industry factory. And I think the region is called Piping. That's the name of it. Um, so, like I said, British. The idea here is get more forces out to Australia, which is what they're doing there. Uh, South Africa, they're building units there. They're going to try to come up to the south, up towards the north, try to get Egypt back. It's embattled. And building forces in Canada, which is strange, to try to ship them over. This is what the map looks like after all the battles have been resolved. Just the overview you can observe. It's a big map. It's, I think it's four feet by four feet. Now I think I'm pretty sure it is, and uh, but gorgeous, just wonderful map. Uh, so the map's preset. That's the end of round one, and we'll be going around two. So I guess it's up to you guys to decide. Do we play round two? How do you guys want the battles to be handled? Do I continue this? It's set up still, but if I, I'm gonna try to take it down within two weeks if we don't do nothing. But I appreciate you guys watching. Sorry for the horrendous commentary. Hey mate, you British, you British fans. Um, and uh, overall, uh, it's fun filming. It's fun playing. Takes a heck of a lot of time. Yeah. But thanks so much, guys, for watching. Like I said, leave a commentary how you guys want me to handle the battles. And do you guys even want to see round two? Be blessed.